So I'm, I'm chairing your session, Lucas. So, <laughs> so welcome everybody to the second part of the tutorial. So the tutorial will be given by uh, Lucas Slot. Lucas is uh, doing his PhD at uh, CWI, actually in its, in its last uh, months. So the floor is, is yours, Lucas. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so this is part two of uh, uh, the tutorial that Monique started this morning. Uh, so Monique talked about uh, convergence rates for upper bounds, and I will talk about convergence rates uh, for lower bounds. Okay. Um, so just to repeat, just as in the first part, um, we want to minimize some polynomial f um, over a, a set um, uh, s, which in the first talk was uh, only uh, assumed to be compact. Uh, but now we're actually going to assume that it, it's uh, it's semi-algebraic, okay? Um, and so some examples of interest that we also saw in the in the first part are the binary hypercube, uh, the hypersphere, the ball, and the standard simplex. And what I've written here on the right are just the descriptions of these sets as uh, semi-algebraic sets, right? So they can each be written as the um, the set of all points where where some set of polynomials is. Uh, is non-negative, okay? Um, so this polynomial optimization problem, you can reformulate it in a sort of trivial way. Instead of saying we want to minimize f, you can say I want to maximize uh, lambda uh, so that lambda uh, f minus lambda is non-negative for all x in, in my semi-algebraic set S, right? So this is just rewriting, uh, rewriting the problem. But now this allows you to define relaxations. Um, and the way you define a relaxation is by uh, choosing a set which is smaller and simpler uh, than, than P of S, which is sort of the set, the cone of all uh, positive uh, polynomials. Instead, you look at something um, which is simpler and easier uh, to optimize over. And if you do this, if you just replace P of S by some subset of P of S, then what you get is a lower bound uh, on the minimum. And so there's uh, two choices of, of Q uh, that will be used in this in this talk. Um, so the first one, uh, which gives you the Putinar uh, uh, lower bound, um, is just this this quadratic module, which I think we have we have seen already a few times uh, in in this workshop, and I'm sure that most of you are are familiar with. Um, but you take take the set QR of S, which consists of all polynomials, which can be written as a uh, sum of a constraint GI uh, times some sum of squares polynomial uh, sigma i, so that the total degree is at most 2R. And so why is Q a subset of the non-negative polynomials? Well, GI is non-negative on S by definition, right? That's how we how we defined S. Um, and a sum of squares uh, sigma is, is non-negative uh, globally, so this sum must be non-negative uh, on S, right? So this gives you the, the putin R type hierarchy. And then you can also take a slightly uh, bigger set, which I call here like uh, script T of S, um, which gives you the Smutkin type uh, hierarchy. And this, this set now is known as the pre-ordering. And the difference between this uh, Q and this T is that in the T, we are also allowed to take products of the constraints, right? So here we have one sum of squares polynomial per constraint, whereas here we have one sum of squares polynomial for each product of constraints. So in principle, we can have many, many more uh, sum of squares polynomials. Um, and as again, I, I'm sure you all, you all know, and we have also already seen a couple of times uh, during this workshop, um, this leads to uh, semi-definite programming bonds, right? So these, um, these bounds can be computed by uh, semi-definite programming because membership in these cones uh, is, is a semi-definite program. Okay, so just to summarize, so we have now two hierarchies, which I'll denote uh, F Putinar and F uh, Schmutgen, uh, which is a lower bound on the, uh, on the minimum of F over S, which is obtained by um, optimization over either the quadratic module Q or the pre-ordering S. And then we have these two theorems, which kind of uh, explain why I named these Putinar and Schmutgen. 
which are Putinars and uh, Schmutgen's Positivstellen uh, Satz. And what they say is that these bounds converge to the, the global minimum as uh, the order R uh, goes to infinity. And you need some condition on S. So in the case of Putinar, um, you need that S is Archimedean, uh, which basically means that um, S contains a, a ball constraint, right? So what this, this constraint is telling you is just that S is contained in a, a ball of radius R. Um, and for Schmutgen, you need something weaker, uh, which is just that S is, is compact, right? And of course, if you, if you are a comedian, then you must be compact because you are contained uh, in a ball. Um, but it's not the same because you could be compact, um, but not contain this particular constraint inside your quadratic module, right? It, it, it doesn't have to be inside, inside the quadratic module. So that's the, that's the difference. Um, and now, just as in the first part of the tutorial of, of this tutorial, we are interested in, in quantifying this convergence, right? So we want to say something about the error of the Putinar and of the Schmutkin hierarchy in terms of the level, the level R, right? So not just saying that, okay, asymptotically it converges, but how fast does it, does it converge? And so on this slide, I, I just put, um, uh, some, some, some known results, um, so on the top, I have three results which apply uh, quite generally. Um, so we have this, these, these, uh, this first and this third result are the oldest. They are due to uh, Denise Schweigover and, and Schweigover, and they establish the first sort of quantified convergence rate um, for general sets. And so the top one, this is giving you a one over log R uh, divided by C to the C um, convergence rate for the Putinar hierarchy on general Archimedean sets. Okay, and here C is just a constant which depends on your set S. Um, now this was actually recently um, uh, improved by Baldi and Molin to get uh, one over R to the C. And I think uh, Lorenzo uh, also talked about this in a previous, maybe the, the previous uh, Poema workshop or, or conference. Um, and, and the interesting thing is now that, that, that for a long time, um, this rate for the Putinar hierarchy was much, much worse than the rate for the Schmutgen hierarchy, which is here on the third, on the third line, right? Because for, for Putinar, we had this sort of exponentially slow, um, convergence, whereas for uh, uh, Schmutgen, we had a, a polynomial convergence rate. Uh, but now, actually, with this new result, um, the the Putinar and the Schmutgen hierarchy have a very similar convergence rate. Okay, there are some some constants here, there are some some details, but but they are quite similar now, which is which is pretty surprising, right? Because this um, this this pre ordering was much bigger than the than the module. But now we have actually sort of a similar similar convergence rate. So these are all the, the general results. And then the other columns, they all refer to some specific set S where we can show something uh, something better. And now certainly with this new uh, baldi Morem result, you can sort of think of these as um, uh, proving some value of C, right? So you can sort of think as this result, for instance, here on the on the box where we show one over r uh, r squared, you could sort of think of it as proving that c in this result is is at least two. Okay, um, and just to sort of uh, give some idea of why we why we still care about this, right? You could say, okay, we have these these nice general results, so why why do we need these specific sets? Um, so there's I guess a couple of reasons. So first of all. Um, as Monique already explained, these uh, special sets are, are quite fundamental, right? So the box, the binary cube, the hypersphere, the simplex, um, these are, are really the, the semi-algebraic sets that, that show up a lot. And so understanding in a bit more detail the behavior of the bound is sort of intrinsically interesting, right? So improving from one over R to the C to one over R to the two is interesting because you sort of care about these sets um, intrinsically. And then maybe uh, a second reason is that 
Uh, sometimes it can be very helpful to really understand the behavior on one of these simple sets uh, very well, because it can actually help you prove something uh, for the general sets. And I won't go into too much detail here, but actually um, this result for the Schmutken hierarchy um, on the on the box, so this minus one, one to the N, um, this result is actually used as a, a lemma in this recent general result by, by Baldi and Moran. And the basic idea, I think we already maybe saw some of this in, in Pond's talk, is that you can sometimes embed your complicated semi-algebraic set S into a larger simple set like the like the box. And then you can somehow relate these convergence rates. But this requires you to already know uh, something about the convergence rate on the simple set. Which means you can, these can also be, be useful uh, for that purpose. Okay. Um, the point of this talk is that if you look at all the results which are now in, in red, um, so most of these are, are due to, to myself and Monique, but actually the first one uh, here on the hypersphere is due to, to Fog and Fazi. Um, these are all uh, based on what is essentially the same proof technique, or at least a proof technique that share many, many similarities. Um, and I would sort of say that this was, was started by, by Fog and Fazi, who did this for the hypersphere. And then I, I guess Monique and I use this as inspiration to also do sort of similar things on, on all of these all of these other sets. Um, and so the main the main idea of this tutorial will be to explain what this technique is, how it works, um, and how you can can apply it uh, to each of these each of these examples. Okay. Um, so this technique that I was referring to, I call it the polynomial kernel method. Um, because it involves polynomial kernels. Um, it, it consists essentially of, of three steps. Um, so the first step is that we will use uh, so-called reproducing kernels or Christoffel Darboux kernels um, to define a new parameter, which I'll denote F, F harm, so F harmonic, um, which is also a lower bound on the minimum of F and which depends on some non-negative univari uh, univariate polynomial Q. Right, which which is given, and then what we show is that if you choose your Q to be a sum of squares, right, and, and remember Q is is now univariate, if you choose it to be a, a sum of squares, um, then you actually find that this harmonic bound is always worse than um, than the SOS bound, than the Boutinard bound, or the Schmutgen bound, right, depending on depending on the example, and so. Um, if I can say something, and this is step three, if I can say something about the harmonic bound, so I can say the harmonic bound is at most epsilon away from the true uh, minimum, then this will immediately tell me that the um, SOS bound is at most epsilon away from the minimum, right? Because it is it is sort of wedged in between these two things. And and the same is, of course, true for the smooth right? I could replace F put here by, uh, by F smooth. Um, and the interesting thing, and, and Monique already... I think alluded to this uh, this morning is that analyzing this harmonic bound actually has a, an interesting connection to these upper bounds that we discussed in part one. So we'll find that analyzing the the, the error for this harmonic bound um, comes down to analyzing um, um, the error for some instance of the uh, of the measure based upper bounds. Okay, um, so just a little bit of of, of uh, foreshadowing. So. There's essentially three three cases. Uh, so the first case um, is the hypersphere and the binary cube, and there we have what's known as the the Funk-Hecke formula, which essentially tells you that your reproducing kernels are are very very nice. They have a very nice nice structure, and we will end up with some problem involving either Gegenbauer for the for the hypersphere or Kraft-Schuh polynomials for the binary cube. And remember, Gegenbauer's, these are, are just these Jacobi polynomials that Monique talked about when the parameters are, are equal. So they're a special case of the Jacobi uh, polynomials. So for the uh, bowl and for the simplex, you don't have a funk hecke formula. You get what I call here a, a complicated summation formula. So you get, again, some expression for your reproducing kernel, um, which is now a little bit more, more complicated. And everything reduces back to Gegenbauer polynomials. And then finally, for the um, for the box, we will use the so-called Jackson kernel, 
um, which is an existing kernel from um, from approximation uh, theory, but very well known, well studied. Um, and then will we we will be able to reduce back to analyzing Chebyshev polynomials. Okay. Um, so now I will sort of um, explain these steps in 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 more detail. And the example that I will use uh, first is the is the hypersphere. Uh, but we will first have some some sort of general uh, general setup and, and definitions. Okay, so let's say I have a, a compact set X in, in Rn, and I have some finite Borel measure which is supported on X. Um, and Borel, uh, yeah, I think maybe Juan actually also mentioned this, or maybe Etienne. Chen. It, it just means that if you integrate a non-zero polynomial over X. With respect to, or a non-zero, non-negative polynomial with respect to this measure, you get something which is uh, which is non-zero. Um, so this measure defines an inner product on the space of of polynomials on X um, simply by integration, right? So I just integrate with respect to uh, to, to mu. And now, because we have an, an inner product, we can we can write down an, an orthonormal basis, right, with respect to this inner product, which I order in such a way that p alpha has degree equal to uh, absolute value of alpha. And what I mean by this is just the the sum of the of the entries of alpha. And now I can decompose my space, um, my space of polynomials, as a direct sum. So I can write this as a sum of these subspaces HK, where HK is just the span of these orthonormal uh, basis elements where uh, alpha is K, right? So where the degree is equal to K. This gives me, this gives me a, a decomposition. Um, and what we'll do quite often in, in what follows is we will decompose our polynomials uh, according to this, this decomposition, right? So if I can decompose my entire space, then I can also decompose um, um, a polynomial where now each of these uh, PKs lies in HK and where uh, D is just uh, the degree of, of P. Okay, so this gives me an, an, an orthonormal uh, decomposition. Um, and now I can define uh, kernel operators. So a, a kernel, which I'll always denote K, is, is nothing more than a, a function from x times x to r, right? So it's just a function of two variables on x. Um, and together with my um, measure mu, uh, this, this, this kernel always induces a, a linear operator, which sends a polynomial to a polynomial, uh, again, using integration, right? So what, what the operator k does is it sends a polynomial uh, p uh, to the polynomial you obtain by integrating with respect to this kernel. And that is actually equal to just taking the inner product of, of k and, and p, right? So uh, from now on, I will always have these, uh, these kernels written in sort of um, upright font. And I have an associated linear operator, which I'll always write in, in, in bold font. Um, and the point is, this is this is now getting to reproducing kernel kernels. Is that we always have a kernel which I'll denote uh, C D for Christoffel Darboux, which is just given by summing the orthonormal basis elements, which has the property that it reproduces low degree polynomials. Meaning that if I um, if I apply the associated operator to a polynomial p of degree d, I just get get back p. So why is this? Well, if you look at the form of, of CD, it just consists of these, these orthonormal um, um, basis elements. And so if I, if I consider this integral, well, because these are orthonormal elements, if I take this integral, I, I just get uh, one um, uh, when alpha equals, equals beta, basically, and I get, I get zero otherwise. So if I put something in, um, which has low degree, then I just get the same thing, same thing out again, right? This is this is just orthonormality of of this basis. Um, and like I said, so this this kernel is called the reproducing kernel, 
or sometimes the, the crystal folder book or not. And so it depends both on, on X, um, but also on the measure mu that I, that I put on X. Um, and also, like I, like I said before, if you have some nice structure on X, then often this kernel uh, will have a bit of a simpler expression uh, than this, this sum over here. Um, and that is sort of the, the key fact that we will exploit. Sorry to interrupt you. Could you briefly yeah. explain again what uh, what the X is, and right. what exactly like what exactly is the um, are the things that you put into into the boldface K and into the non boldface K? Right. So so X is just a um, a subset of R n. Mm -hmm. so think of X as being our semi algebraic set. So maybe it's mm -hmm. the sphere, or maybe it's the bowl, mm -hmm. uh, or the binary cube. So K just takes uh, uh, two elements of of X and it sends it to a real number. And then what what boldface K does is it takes a a polynomial on X, and it sends it to a new polynomial on X. And the way that it does this is via this integral transform. So so um, so R is the space of polynom polynomials. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, yeah, and so boldface K takes a polynomial uh, P and it sends it to a, a new polynomial K of P, which is defined via this integral transform. Yeah, ah, okay. I, I was just confused because there's written this K of P of X, but only P is the argument of K, right? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so this is indeed um, maybe a little bit confusing is that the argument of K here is, is only P. Mm -hmm. But then in order to sort of define what K of P is, I write K of P of X. Okay, okay. I think I got it. May I also ask something related? So, uh, uh, I think you have a technical problem in, in, in the case of a sphere, right? Because if uh, if you set X as non-empty interior, or if it's uh, contained in a, in an algebraic hypersurface, then I don't think that you really can work with polynomials, so it, it wouldn't be well defined, your, your K, your operator K, I guess, right? You are just saying KP of X. Um, uh, I think it's um, yeah. So, so the, the way I had hoped to sort of put this under the under the rug is is by working on this 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 uh, ma uh, script R, um, which on the sphere it would not be all polynomials. It would sort of be all polynomials modulo ah. uh, one minus X. Oh. Could you could you repeat the, the definition of script R, please? Uh, so I, I didn't I didn't really give it, um, but script R is the the space of polynomials restricted to X. Um, ah, okay, okay. So I this didn't is kind of it. hiding hiding the fact yes. that uh, okay, that some when, when everything is okay. Thank you. Yes. No, I, I agree that this is a little bit under the under the carpet, um, mm -hmm. but indeed. So in in the case of the sphere. Uh, R would not just be all polynomials, it would be all polynomials uh, modulo um, the equality constraint. Okay, um, but so we, we have this, this, this reproducing, uh, reproducing uh, kernel. And now let's, let's see what it, what it looks like on the, on the sphere. So on the sphere, uh, we usually take the, the uniform surface measure, um, mu. Okay. And, it's mi and um, uh, we then have have an, an action of uh, of on on the polynomials on sn which is is just like this right so tp of x is just uh, p of of t inverse of x and and on is just the uh, orthogonal matrices um and if we think about this this decomposition that i had a, a few slides slides ago in this particular case it will just be in in um um, in terms of, of, of so-called spherical harmonics. Um, and these are just the polynomials which are um, homogeneous and, and harmonic of the Greek K. And what it means to be harmonic is, is not so important for this talk, um, but basically it means if, it, yeah, if this says anything to you, then they are the harmonic polynomials. If you, if you don't know what this means, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter, uh, matter for us, but this is a, a, a well-known well -known decomposition. And the sort of interesting thing here, and I, I think we will also see this back again in the in the talk of, of Funk this afternoon, is that these these spaces are actually invariant and irreducible under under this action. 
And so what it means is that if you if you take anything polynomial p in in harm in harm k, and you apply one of these um, orthogonal matrices, then you again get something uh, which is in harm k. Um, this, is, this is what invariant means, and then irreducible simply means that you you could not um, let's say decompose these harms even further into into invariant uh, invariant spaces. These are sort of the the smallest invariant pieces. And so in this case, um, we have what's known as the addition formula for spherical uh, harmonics, which tells us that the um, sum over the ortho uh, orthonormal basis elements is actually just the Gegenbauer polynomial uh, of, the, of the inner product. Right? So it tells us that this sum is equal to the, uh, to the Gegenbauer polynomial evaluated in X inner product uh, inner product uh, y, and as a direct consequence, we get a very nice expression for the reproducing kernel, right? Because if you recall, the reproducing kernel was nothing other than this this sum over over the ortho orthonormal basis elements, which now, because of the addition formula, uh, we know is just a sum over uh, Gegenbauer polynomials in the in the uh, inner product, and so. Our, our reproducing kernel has a very nice, uh, nice expression, and this is what we are we are going to exploit um, to prove bounds for the uh, SOS hierarchy. Okay, so I put here we we will now go to to SN and the binary cube. Um, so recall we we have some some polynomial f uh, on on SN, and we we want to minimize it. Um, and what we will do is we will consider a, a univariate polynomial, Q, which I write in the basis of Gegenbauer polynomials. And I can do this because, as Monique already said, these Gegenbauer polynomials, they, they form an, an, an orthogonal basis uh, for the univariate polynomials. Now, I will look at a kernel, um, Q, uh, K, of, K of Q, which is just obtained by evaluating Q in the inner product X times Y. And by this Funk-Hecker formula, this, um, uh, this kernel uh, has a very nice property, namely the operator which is associated to it um, uh, does the following. It just sends f to the sum of uh, q hat k f k. Um, and so why is this the case? Well, if we, if we go back a little bit, we saw that this uh, reproducing kernel was just equal to the sum of the Gegenbauer polynomials. And so now our kernel QK is again this sum of Gegenbauer polynomials, but now with these with these coefficients uh, Q hat K. And so if we apply it to F, we sort of get get again F, but now with these coefficients uh, Q hat K. Okay. And because I assumed that my uh, Q hat K were were non-zero. Um, I can also sort of talk about the the inverse of this operator, which is is just the same thing, but now you get uh, one over q hat of k. Okay. Um, and the intuition here is that if these q hat k's are uh, almost equal to one, that this kernel q k uh, k q uh, will be almost equal to the Christoffel Darboe kernel, to the reproducing kernel. Right. In particular, if they were equal to one, then it would be the Christoffel Darboe kernel. So if they are close to one, then they are som somehow almost the Christoffel Darboe kernel. Okay. So this is sort of this this first uh, this first step. We have now defined um, a kernel, and then what what Fung and Fazi show is that if you choose this univariate polynomial Q to be a sum of squares, then you obtain a um, a lower bound on the minimum, which is actually a lower bound on the SOS hierarchy. And the way you obtain it is by evaluating K inverse of F uh, on all points uh, on, the, on the sphere. So let's, let's see why this is true. So proof. So the first observation is that if Q is a, a sum of squares, then this this kernel uh, k of q lies in the quadratic module of the sphere for fixed y. And so what I mean by this, if you fix y, 
and then kqxy is just a polynomial in x. And because q is a sum of squares, it is actually a, a sum of squares in x, right? Because x uh, inner product y is just uh, a linear polynomial in x. Okay. And now I claim that this will give me a sum of squares representation for f minus this, this harmonic, harmonic bound. And so why is this true? Well, I can write f minus the harmonic bound as k of k inverse of f minus the harmonic bound, right? So this is, is really doing, doing nothing. I'm just applying an operator and then the operator inverse. So this should, should do nothing. Then I can pull out my, my k of q and pull in the uh, constant f harm q. And the reason I can do this is because uh, uh, q hat zero was one, which basically means that uh, kq of one equals one, right? It sends the constant polynomial to the constant uh, polynomial. And now if I, if I go back to the definition, the definition of this, of this kernel operator was that it, um, it is just integrating, right? With respect to the original, original kernel. So this expression here is just equal to, to this expression, um, this integral on, on the bottom. And now this integral consists of two parts. There is on the left, my kernel K, which was um, a sum of squares. It was in the, in the quadratic module, right? This is the first thing we, we said. And then we have this part on the right, um, which now by definition of F harm Q must be uh, non-negative for all Y, right? Because I, I chose F harm Q to be the minimum over, over all of these values. So this value here must be, must be non-negative. Can I make a question? Yeah. KQ is invertible for polynomials of small degree. Yes. Right. And F is assumed to be a polynomial. Yes. So, so F is a, a polynomial of degree D and uh, indeed KQ is invertible for polynomials of degree D. Uh, okay, right. Right, and, and the inverse, I, I wrote it, it's, it's just by inverting the, the coefficients uh, Q, QK. So, um, sorry to interrupt again, but then there is this, this theorem of Fung and Fafsi that should also hold true if you just say that Q is the sum of squares on the, on the sphere, right? Um, so, so Q is a univariate polynomial. Uh, ah, okay. Um, and so in, in this case, it is just a univariate sum of squares. Oh, yeah, sorry, that was stupid. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> it's, it, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of notation and, and things, so mm -hmm. it's a bit confusing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so just to clarify, so if Q is not a zero polynomial, when KQ restricted to low degree polynomials is invertible. Is, is that what you were saying or? Yes. So uh, KQ is invertible um, basically as long as these coefficients uh, are not zero. Oh, you mean really KQ as an operator on the so on K -K -Q space of polynomials is invertible as a whole operator? KQ is invertible as an operator on the space of polynomials of degree at most D. This is the, this is all we need. And this is all definitely true. And, and what is D because there is no D on the slide so here. D, D is the degree of F. Uh, I should have probably. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So we, we were left off with this, this integral representation. And, and now I claim um, uh, that we that we are done. And and why is this the case? Well, um, we now have a, a an integral where on the one hand we have something non-negative, and on the other hand we we have something uh, which is in the quadratic module. And so you can sort of think of this as being an infinite conic combination of things which are in this cone uh, Q R. And so it is all also in this, in this, in this cone. And if you don't believe this immediately, then a very easy way to see this 
is uh, by using a cubature rule, right? So this integral um, can always be written as some uh, finite uh, uh, sum with, with positive weights, just using a positive cubature rule. And then you see immediately that this is just a conic combination of things which are in this in this cone, and so it is in fact also also in the in the cone. And I'll I'll just note here um, that this representation is not explicit, right? So just because I know that I can represent it like this, it doesn't mean that I I have an explicit explicit representation. It just proves that a representation exists. Okay. Um, so now what we know is that if, if Q is a sum of squares, um, then I can I can I can build a uh, a sum of squares representation for my original polynomial f using this kernel uh, k of k of Q. Um, and so it remains to show the following, which they which they then also do, um, which is that this this harmonic bound um, um, is sufficiently close to the real the real minimum. So in other words, I can choose my sum of squares Q in in such a way that the harmonic bound is at most one over R squared away uh, from the global minimum. And as a direct result, um, the Putinar bound can be at most uh, one over R squared away from the uh, from the global minimum. Okay. Um, so so proof. Uh, so recall the, the definition of this, this inverse operator, this inverse kernel. Um, it is just sending f uh, to, to this sum. And so for any x, I know that the difference between fx and uh, k inverse f of x um, is just equal to, uh, to this sum, sum over here, right? Because fx is just the sum of the fk. And k inverse of f is, is this sum, so this difference um, is, is this expression. And now I can just use uh, the triangle triangle inequality uh, to bound this in terms of um, in terms of the difference between one and one over q k, and um, the maximum, so the supremum norm um, of these of these f k on the on the sphere. Okay. And so, what I what I conclude is that um, that the harmonic bound um, is is at most uh, this expression on the on the bottom away from the from the global minimum, and so it it remains to to analyze this this expression. Okay, so I, I write it again. It remains to analyze uh, this expression, which consists of of two factors. Um, and now I, I have two claims. So the first claim is. There exists a sum of squares Q for which um, the left expression is, is small. And as we'll see on the on the next slide, that is actually just a special case of the uh, of the measure of, of, of the measure based uh, measure based hierarchy, which Monique discussed um, this morning. And then the second claim, um, this supremum norm of of F K can be bounded in terms of the supremum norm of f. Um, and this is, this is not trivial, uh, but I will not, not spend any time on it uh, today. I will just say that, that Fang and Vasi show this uh, for the sphere uh, using, an, using an inductive proof uh, and some properties of spherical harmonics. Um, we prove it also in the context of the binary cube uh, where you have a very similar similar setup, and the proof we 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 use there actually also applies to the sphere, and you get you get a, a little bit of a better constant. And just to mention it, a similar but slightly weaker statement also holds on the unit ball and and the simplex. Um, but but I won't I won't spend more time on this uh, today. It's 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 quite quite technical. It's it's not trivial. It, it's actually it, it's sort of an interesting question, but uh, we we don't have we don't have time for it. So let me just on the on the next slide explain um, how to choose your sum of squares Q in order to to minimize um, the difference between one and one over uh, Q hat K. Okay. So just to reiterate again, we want to choose our, our sum of squares, which is expressed in the basis of Gegenbauer polynomials, 
uh, minimizing the sum of absolute values. And so the first uh, uh, note I'll make is that actually we can simplify quite a bit instead of looking at this absolute value and instead of looking at one over QK, it is in fact enough to minimize uh, just the sum uh, of one minus QK. And this is just a, a technical argument, uh, but intuitively the reason that this is true is because if one over something has to be close to one, well, that's sort of the same as saying that 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 thing has to be has to be close to one, and so minimizing uh, minimizing this term up to some some constants in a technical argument is the same as as just minimizing this uh, this sum over here, which is much easier because it's it's linear. It doesn't involve these um, these fractions. Now the Gegenbauer polynomials are an orthogonal basis. And so I can write my coefficients uh, q hat k uh, in terms of inner products with, with Gegenbauer polynomials. Um, and this inner product, this is just an integral with respect to a certain measure on, on minus one one. Um, it's just the measure for which the Gegenbauer polynomials are, are orthogonal. And the only thing I have to be careful of is that I have to, have to choose the right normalization. I have to choose the right normalization and in this case, the right normalization will be to say that uh, uh, the Gegenbauer at one should, should be one. And this is why I write now uh, hat above the Gegenbauers to indicate that uh, the normalization is different than, than here on the top of the slide. But I can write my, my uh, coefficients like this just because it's an orthogonal basis. And so... Um, I now claim that that the the best choice of of q is actually via um, the following uh, the following program, and and let me let me unpack this a little bit. So I will write g of x um, for the polynomial, which is just d minus the sum of the first d uh, Gegenbauer polynomials, and so. Uh, if I if I look now at this this expression on the bottom, what what are we doing? So let's first look at the right. So on the right, we are saying that integral of q x d omega x must be one, but this integral is simply equal to q zero, right? For, by this by this formula, and so what actually this thing on the right is saying is that q zero should be one, which was our our first uh, which was our condition. And then let's look at the objective function, the thing on the on the left. Um, if you look at what gx is, um, this integral is actually nothing more uh, than than one minus the sum of these of these qks, right? So in fact, this this integral on the left, uh, using this expression for for the q hat k, is nothing more uh, than the sum of uh, uh, one minus uh, uh, QK hat, right? It's it's just a, 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 a just a, a, a rewriting of this expression using uh, the fact that these Q hat Ks are given by these by these integrals. And and so indeed, if I solve this minimization problem, it gives me exactly the uh, the sum of squares polynomial Q which minimizes um, the thing I want, I want to minimize and which has uh, Q hat zero equal to one. And now I'm, I'm kind of testing your, your memory maybe, um, but the thing we have written down here is exactly the measure based upper bound that, that Monique discussed this morning, right? We are choosing a sum of squares, which should be a density and we are uh, minimizing uh, some some um, expectation with respect to this density of G. So this is exactly the measure based upper bound for G on the interval with respect to this measure uh, omega, which corresponds to the Gegenbauer polynomials. And so as we saw in part one, um, the error for that bound can be expressed in terms of the uh, roots of the Gegenbauer polynomials. And this complete, uh, completes the analysis because we know that these roots 
are of the order uh, one over r squared. Right? So Monique, Monique uh, already already told us this. And I should be a little bit precise here. Actually, um, we know that these uh, roots are of the form one minus o uh, one over r squared. But this gives us an error in in one over r squared. And that finishes the analysis, right? Because it, it shows that we can choose our Q for which this expression is, is of the order uh, one over R squared. So uh, uh, by the by this theorem, uh, we, we have thus shown shown this this theorem of Fung and Fazi. Okay. Um so I will maybe pause here for a short question. Yeah, so how do you get rid of the absolute value? Right. Um, so, like I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a technical argument, but basically uh, you can show that, in fact, um, the Q hat K will always be between 0 and 1. And so the absolute value just disappears uh, automatically. And you do this by, by somehow inspecting the Gegenbauer polynomials. You have to give some technical argument based on the Gegenbauer polynomials, and you can, you can show that, uh, that these coefficients will always be between 0 and 1. Okay. Okay, um, so if there are no more questions, I'm just... Uh, oh. Yes, uh, I, Lucas, it is Lorenzo. I, <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, if you go back one slide, for in the slide 14, you just mentioned that you have some weaker statement for the unit ball instead of this unit sphere. Mm -hmm. So, do, can you deduce the result for the ball from the sphere, or do you, it's just another different, it is a different technique? It's a different technique. So as far as I know, um, you you cannot you cannot uh, deduce it. So so, I mean maybe to say one or two things. So the 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 thing that's happening here is you you have your original polynomial f, which has some supremum norm, and then you decompose it into a sum of these f k. And now these f k they might have a supremum norm which is much bigger than the original supremum norm. Of your of your function, and so you need some way to show that it is not too much bigger, right? Because if if it would be huge, then your your bound would be would be quite bad. And what is what is kind of interesting is, of course, um, you can use some equivalence of norms argument uh, to get a constant. Um, but in fact, it it turns out that for the uh, hypersphere and also for the binary cube. You can actually choose this constant independently of the dimension n. Okay. This is really the sort of key uh, key statement, and that remains true for the unit ball. Some some somehow, but not for the simplex. And there, this is why I say sort of weaker statement. So for the unit ball, it's still true, but you get some more some more uh, garbage, let's say. And for the simplex, I don't know if it's true. At least I cannot prove it. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. And another question, you, the analysis that you're going for the, uh, for the hypersphere, do you think can be generalized in some way to other compact uh, varieties? I don't know, for a compact irreducible hypersurface? I mean, if you have a real polynomial defining a compact uh, uh, variety, do you think this can be extended somehow? Um. Uh, you are really using the symmetry quite heavily. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to say maybe, but but it, it, the difficulty is that you you need some analogon for these 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 reproducing kernels. You need some nice expression for your reproducing kernel in order to apply this technique. And as far as I know, you don't have this for like a, a general compact uh, variety, even if it's let's say defined by a single single polynomial. But but if you do, then then maybe. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, right. So what we have we have sort of done now is we have done the entire proof uh, for for the sphere, which uh, took me <laughs> substantially more time than I had hoped. But this is uh, this is not a problem. Uh, but it will mean that I I will from now uh, skip skip a, a few things. Um, so. 
one thing I will maybe just put it put it here. I will say a few words. There is again a connection to cubature rules, right? So Monique also talked about this for the upper bounds. There was a connection to cubature rules, and this is also true for the for the lower bounds. And this is actually uh, something that uh, Mauricio uh, Velasco and his student um, Sergio uh, Cristancho they have some upcoming work on. I don't think it's on the on the archive uh, yet. Uh, but it's quite interesting. It, it shows that if you have a positive cubature rule, let's say on the hypersphere, um, then this actually also allows you to compute some some lower bound, um, which is in fact, um, yeah, I, I put it here, which is in in fact related a little bit to this harmonic bound that I that I put before. Um, and so just to say say one word, in the harmonic bound, we are minimizing. Uh, k inverse of f over over all points in the sphere, whereas for this cubature bound, you are only minimizing it over the cubature points, and so this actually gives you gives you a a better bound somehow. It also allows you to analyze the Putinar bound because it it's still worse than the Putinar bound, um, but it only requires you to to uh, to do some evaluations, which is in principle easy because you can compute k inverse of f easily. Now the big downside is you need the cubature rule, right? So this is where the no no free lunch uh, uh, comes in. But they they have some upcoming work on this, so I I I, yeah, I recommend once it hits the archive to to check it out. Um, but I will skip it uh, skip it for now. Um, I will also go over the the binary cube a bit more a bit more briefly. We will also see it see it in the exercises. Um, so like I said, the binary cube is actually very similar. To the to the hypersphere, but there are some some key differences, and and the main difference is that the the binary cube is a finite finite set, and so in particular the space of polynomials restricted to the binary cube is a, a finite dimensional finite dimensional space, and so what this means is that the sum of square hierarchy actually uh, converges at uh, after finitely finitely many steps. And so in particular, it, it doesn't really make sense to analyze it as the level goes to infinity, because we already know that it, it's just exact at some, some fixed level. Um, and so instead what we do, um, so I put here the theorem, we, we give an analysis of this hierarchy as both the dimension N and the level R are, are going to, inf to infinity, infinity simultaneously. And the way we do this is by, by proving the following theorem, which actually bounds the error of the hierarchy in terms now of roots of Kravchuk polynomials. So thinking back about the previous theorem, we were actually bounding it in terms of uh, Gegenbauer polynomials. Now we are bounding it in terms of, of Kravchuk polynomials. Um, but actually, for the most part, is it, but it's a similar statement. And what this allows us just very briefly to do is it allows us to, to bound the error in uh, the regime where uh, the level goes to infinity, the order or the dimension n also goes to infinity, but r is some fixed um, fraction of n. So for instance, r over n is, is equal to t. Um, and, and just to, to, have, to have a little a little picture, this is kind of showing you that if you are taking r and n to infinity, um, um, then the the error of the Lasser hierarchy at order order R is is bounded by this by this by this blue line. Okay, um, and I I want to say more about this, but I I I, re, I really don't have time, and I want to co also cover something something else in the in the end. Um, and I ju I just put put here, so this is an exercise. Um, we have the proof for the binary cube, which is very similar to what we do on the hypersphere. You have to get an orthonormal basis. You have to prove some summation formula. This gives you a Funk-Hecke formula, which allows you to express your reproducing kernel in a nice way, but now using Kravchuk polynomials. And then this allows you to choose a univariate polynomial, uh, which gives you a, a, good, a good convergence rate. But we will actually see this um, we will actually see this again in the in the exercises and probably also in in Funk's uh, Funk's talk this afternoon, so I will skip it skip it for now, and I just want to say uh, one or two things uh, more. So 
the unit ball and the simplex, I already said, um, the proof is again very similar, um, but we have much nastier expressions for the reproducing kernel, right? So before we, we had some, uh, some expression just in terms of Gegenbauer polynomials. Now we get, well, again, Gegenbauer polynomials, but it, it looks already a lot more complicated. We don't just have an inner product. We have these, these terms depending on the, on the norm. Um, but in fact, you can sort of do very similar things. You can again define this, this kernel uh, K of Q, uh, which again has these sort of nice, uh, nice properties. Um, you just need to do a little bit more to show uh, that this actually gives you some of squares representations. So this just involves, um, yeah, some computations where you need to show that certain terms uh, cancel out as you, as you need them to. Um, but this can all be all be made to work. Um, so this is the formula for the for the ball, and for the simplex, you you get something um, you get something something similar, but the the, the expressions the formulas are, are different. So you need to uh, to to do, to do the work uh, again. And then, so I, I realize this is very fast, but like I said, it's it's quite similar. So the last thing I I really wanted to to cover. Um, was the the unit box um so minus one one uh, uh to the end um because here we do something which is a little bit a little bit different okay so um in this case we will first look at the interval um kind of mimicking what monique did this morning so we first look at the univariate case the interval and this will actually allow us to also analyze uh the multivariate case uh, uh later on so the, the interval, um, we equip it with the, the Chebyshev measure. This is just the, the measure uh, given here on the right. And it's called the Chebyshev measure because the orthogonal basis with respect to this measure consists of the Chebyshev polynomials. Right? So they are the polynomials defined by, by this orthogonality relation. And um, this also allows me to write down the, the reproducing kernel, which is now just uh, the sum over these uh, over these Chebyshev polynomials. So now there's a, a nice a nice I, I just call it the theorem here, but there is this nice known kernel, the, the Jackson kernel, um, which is which is uh, uh, sort of based on this reproducing kernel. So what is this theorem saying? So I can define a kernel which I call K, K Jackson, which is uh, the sum over here, but now with coefficients. Uh, uh, lambda k, and it has two important properties. So one, it is non-negative. So it's a non-negative kernel uh, on the uh, on the interval, and two, these lambdas um, they are close to one. Okay, and and this is again really sort of similar to what we did before, right? Before there would have been q hat k's here, and we wanted the q hat k's to be close to one. Um, now we sort of get this for free. This is just a kernel that people already already uh, already used before, and it, it has these 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 properties. Um, what is not clear for this kernel immediately is that it's a sum of squares, right? It's it's not negative, but but why would it be be sum of squares? Um, but this is actually also known, and it's because in the univariate case, actually. Um, there is no difference between between sum of squares and non-negative. So, uh, Lucas, yeah. does this kernel depend on lambda, or is this uh, is this only the Jackson kernel for very specific lambdas? This is the very uh, this is um, this is the Jackson kernel for very specific lambda. Yeah. Okay. Which which satisfy um, this this second second condition. But the second condition does probably not uniquely determine them, right? No. No. Like, yeah. No. Um, so maybe the better way to state the theorem is um, the Jackson kernel, which is a kernel with very specific lambda, satisfies these two conditions. Namely, okay, well, they got it, yes. yeah, it is not negative, and the coefficients are are close to one. Mm -hmm. um, and and now we have this this nice thing in the univariate case that actually, if you are uh, non-negative on the interval, um, then you have a sum of squares representation. On the interval, which just means you are a sum of squares uh, plus a another sum of squares times the uh, the constraint that defines uh, the interval, um, and so 
in particular, this Jackson kernel has an SOS representation if I fix Y, right? Because if I fix Y, it's just a univariate non-negative polynomial on the interval. And so by this, uh, this Markov Lukács theorem, it has a, a sum of squares representation. Now this kernel, this Jackson kernel will play the role of, of, of the previous kernels uh, in, the, in the earlier proof. So again, it induces a linear operator now just really on the space of univariate polynomials of degree uh, degree d, um, whose eigenvalues are equal to these, these coefficients uh, lambda. And so we can use this, this same trick we used before to obtain SOS representations for some polynomial f that we might want to minimize over the, over the interval. Um, and because these coefficients lambda are close to one, we get a representation, um, or we, we, we get a bound, which is uh, also uh, close to zero, right? We, we, may, uh, we, we, we get a bound, which is also one over R squared, order one over R squared. Now on the interval, this is actually not useful because we just showed one slide ago that if you're non-negative on the interval, you are, you are basically SOS. So, I mean, the, the hierarchy is, is just uh, converging immediately, basically, on the interval. Uh, but we can use this univariate kernel to build, build a multivariate kernel. Um, and I, I will just remark very quickly that bringing it back maybe to the upper bounds, um, these Jackson kernels were also used to, to analyze uh, a slight variant of uh, the measure-based upper bound. And Monika, I think, didn't, didn't, didn't talk about this. Um, but this is, this is not so important, but just, just to, to remark that there is again, sort of a, a connection between the upper and the, and the lower, and the lower bounds. Um, okay. So now I, I had planned, uh, a little picture, which maybe, maybe clarifies, uh, a little bit what is actually, what is actually happening here. Um, so let's say I, I have some polynomial F, this is just given here. It's the, it's the blue line. Uh, and I add a small epsilon, let's say uh, 0 0.15, right? So, so the blue line here is my polynomial F plus a, a small epsilon. And now I'm going to imply, uh, apply this, this inverse operator and I'm going to increase, uh, increase the degree R a little bit. And what I want to happen, if we think about this trick, is I want the result of this to still be non-negative on the on the interval, because then I can apply my trick and I get an SOS representation. And so what we see is if I, if I choose a degree five kernel, I obtain uh, this, this orange line here, which is just barely negative. But if I apply the degree seven kernel, I get this red line here, which is non-negative, which is what I want. And so basically what this picture tells you is that our technique allows us to show now that F plus epsilon uh, has a degree seven sum of squares representation, but it does not allow us to show that it has a degree five representation. And this is really the point. And because you can sort of imagine if I take this degree bigger and bigger and bigger, this approximation becomes closer and closer and closer. And so at some point it, it will become uh, it will become non-negative. And the entire idea of the proof is just to sort of estimate when this happens. Like when is the kernel operator close enough to the identity that I can guarantee that my, my approximation is still, is still non-negative, right? This is sort of the, the picture. And the same thing happens for the sphere and for the binary cube. It all happens. It's just a lot harder to draw a picture. Okay. So I just wanted, wanted to show that, um, and then I'll, I'll conclude by sort of hand waving how you get from the <laughs> univariate case to the, to the multivariate case. And uh, because I'm already a little bit over, over time. So, um, the box is just a product of intervals. And so the entire idea is going to be to just take products everywhere and things will, will be all right. So I will, for the measure, I will just take the product of measures that I put on the, uh, on the interval. And then my orthogonal polynomials will just be products of the 
orthogonal polynomials for the interval. I'll just get these multivariate Chebyshev polynomials. They're, they're just products of univariate Chebyshev polynomials. The reproducing kernel, again, it's just, it's just this, this expression. And now I can just build my multivariate Jackson kernel by taking products of univariate uh, Jackson kernels. And the eigenvalues of this multivariate Jackson kernels are just the products of the eigenvalues of the uh, univariate um, polynomial, uh, univariate Jackson kernel. Um, and, and this is sort of the, the one thing you, you, you kind of have to be, have to be a bit careful. I know that my univariate Jackson kernel had a sum of squares representation. And so if I take a product of all these things, well, this product must also have a sum of squares representation. It's, it's just the product of the sum of squares representations, but this now does lie in the pre-ordering, right? Like I said, the difference between the module and the pre-ordering was that the pre-ordering also contains products of the, um, products of the constraints. And because I'm taking products of my Jackson kernel, I also need to have products of, of my constraints to make a sum of squares representation. Um, and this then finally allows us to, to analyze uh, the Schmidtgen type hierarchy um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the unit box. And of course, I mean, um, th there is quite some work, I suppose, still in analyzing the constants that are now hidden by this this big O notation, right? I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of hand waving all these all these products here, but at every step you have to be a little bit careful about what ha what's happening to the to the constants, um, and it's 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 actually quite important because, like I said in the beginning, um, this result is used by Lorenzo and, and Bernard to prove their their general result, uh, but the constants really really do matter, so you have to be uh, you have to be careful. Um, Okay, so that's that's all I, I wanted to say. Um, so I'll just briefly briefly summarize. Um, so the main takeaway should be that if you have a semi-algebraic set with a nice structure, um, then you can analyze the behavior of the SOS hierarchy using reproducing kernels. Uh, and the point is that those reproducing kernels will also have a nice nice structure. So for the hypersphere and the binary cube, you have the classical Fink-Hecker formula. You really have a very, very nice expression. For the unit ball and the simplex, you still get something, but it's already a little bit, a little bit more messy. You have to do a bit more, more work. And then for the, uh, for the box, so there should be uh, minus one, one to, to the n should be here. Um, one has this Jackson kernel, which is this. Uh, the, which is also related to the reproducing kernel and it's, it's sort of well known and you, you can use properties uh, for it that, that were already known. Um, and sort of also, I think, interesting, um, in each case, there is a pretty direct link between the convergence rates for the uh, hierarchy of lower bounds, so just the, the SOS hierarchy, and the convergence rate for this measure-based hierarchy of upper bounds, which Monique talked about. Um, and this connection is usually involving somehow roots of orthogonal polynomials. Um, okay, so I, I went a bit over time, um, but uh, that, that was it. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Lucas. Uh, are there a few more questions left for Lucas before we take the lunch break? Yes. Please go ahead. Yes. Yes, go ahead, please. Ah, okay. uh, yeah, thanks, Lucas, for this nice talk. Uh, um, I, I remember that I've seen in this kernel method uh, that also, so you, you, you start from the, the, for example, the, Christ, the Christopher Darbo kernel, and then you modify by putting weights on the orthogonal polynomials in the, in the definition of the kernel, and you want those weights to be close to one, okay? And I remember that in, in the Jackson kernel or the Fejar kernel, they use this property. They also modify the CD kernel, but they only require the Q0 to be one and the Q1 to be close to one. And that's enough to have a good approximation. Uh, they use this for, uh, for approximating a function. And they say that it's enough to do that, to have approximation good enough on a compact set, whereas the CD kernel has only L L2 norm uh, approximation. And it, it, it's, it's interesting that for the optimization purpose, you need not only the first and the second coefficient to be close to one, 
but all of them. Right. Um, so I, I think I, I, I know what you, what you refer to. Um, I, I think we, we, we thought about this at, at some point we had, so, so the question is in, in my case, um, if we look at, uh, we look at this, this Jackson kernel, I really need sort of all of my, my lambdas to be, to be close to one. Whereas in the optimization community, people generally only require that, for instance, the first one is, is, is close to one. And somehow this is already, already enough. Um, we, we thought about this and I think maybe you can do something similar here where you only, only say the first one is close to one and it already gives you something for everything. Yes. Um, it, it maybe relates a little bit to. So Monique talked about that in the, for the upper bounds, it is always enough to just look at the linear case and the quadratic case, uh, and you don't have to look at everything else. So it, it really reminds me a little bit of, of this. Yes. yes. Uh, mm -hmm. But there are some issues with the analysis here. I think if you, if you only, only look at Lambda, Lambda one, so we, we did not do this. Um, but yes, perhaps it is possible. Perhaps it is enough to only assume something for, for the first few eigenvalues and get an analysis from, from this. Um, so maybe, maybe it's related to the fact that you, you need not only no negativity, but some square representation. Yes. Maybe, in approximation theory, they only need positivity maybe. In this this, this might, might also be an issue, yes. Yeah. Also, I, 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 I like the, this, uh, uh, formula in the sphere uh, for the uh, Gegenbauer polynomial. I mean, we take Kravchuk and the other one because it reminds me also what people like in machine learning. They don't like multivariate kernel, but they like a uh, function of uh, dot product, like uh, like you exactly what you have. You have, you have a kernel which is a, a univariate polynomial of the cross product x y. And, yes. And machine learning, they use this kind of kernels also because they don't want, they want to do economical computation. So they would not, they would not like a multivariate complicated kernel. But they would like a sort of a, a kernel which depends, uh, which is a, fun a univariate function of x, x cross product y, for example. And uh, that's nice that you, you also need this. I mean, the analysis is very nice when you, we, when you have this property of kernel. Yeah, it sort of, uh, it, it, it allows you to go from like a multivariate problem to a univariate problem. Right, that, that's correct. Yeah. Univariate is usually much easier. Yes. So in machine learning, they try to do that also. They, they use this kind of tricks to avoid complicated uh, manipulations. Right. Okay. Well, good. Very nice talk. Thanks. Any other questions? So I see uh, in the chat, maybe you can, the person who... Uh, uh, okay. so I think I saw the question, but I can now no longer see the chat. I think it was about this infinite conic combination. Could you, could you explain more about something? Yes. Mentioning that the two um, module is closed and open. Let's see. Okay. So I think the question was, um, so on this slide, I, I, no, not this slide, uh, this slide. So I, I, I claim that, that because I have this integral representation, it, it, uh, it tells me that, uh, that F X minus F harm, uh, has a sum of squares representation. Um, so, so why, why is this, is this true? Um, so like I said, one way of, of thinking about it is that what I have written down, so this, this final line, it is really an, an infinite conic combination of things which lie in this model, module QR, right? And the reason it's conic is because this expression on the right is non-negative. And now you can ask, so why should infinite conic combination sort of also be, be in the module? Um, and the reason is that this module is, uh, is finite dimensional and, and closed. So, you can write this infinite conic combination sort of as a, a, a limit of, of finite conic combinations. And then this limit must, must still be, uh, be, be in this, in this module. Um, but there is actually an, an easier way to see it, um, which is using this, this cubature formula. And so I will go to the slide I, I skipped. Um, so 
here I have actually almost exactly the same the same expression, um, but now I have used the fact that I have a positive cubature rule for integration on SN. Right, so so what what does it mean? So there is this this there is a theorem which tells you that you can find a positive cubature rule on any set under some some niceness assumptions, but the the, the sphere uh, satisfies them. And, and what it means is that integration of low degree polynomials is just the same as taking a weighted sum of evaluations of that polynomial. And in fact, I can choose these weights to be positive. So what it means is that this integral, which now on the first line, which is almost the same integral I, I had on the previous slide, you can actually write it as a, a sum using your uh, cubature points, y, j, and your positive cubature rate, um, weights, w, j. And now you can really see quite explicitly that you are just taking a conic combination of things which, which lie in the model, right? It, uh, it's not even infinite anymore. It's just a, a conic combination. And so for sure it will, it will be in the, in the cone. So there's sort of two, two ways of seeing it. One is doing some arguments with limits and, and a closed cone and, and whatever. And then the other argument is uh, use a positive cubature rule. Okay. Thanks, Lucas. So, unless there is one more burning question. Um, hi. Um, hi, Lucas. Um, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I was wondering, so you introduced this um, harmonic bound for, for some um, cases at least. And um, um, how useful is it outside of this convergence analysis? Can you actually compute it? And um, how good are the bounds? Does it take? Um, um, so you cannot compute it. Well, okay. So the issue is, so this, this K inverse of, of F, you can compute it, right? Because it is, it is just, uh, here it's on the slide. It's, uh, it's, it's fine. Um, but now I have to minimize it over the sphere, but how do I do this? Right. It's sort of equally difficult to my original problem. It, it again requires me to, to minimize something. Um, I guess in principle, you could do this. I mean, you, you could try, for instance, to, to compute it numerically. Um, but I, I haven't actually done this. Um, I, I don't think there's like a practical application of this because again, computing this harmonic bound in principle is as difficult as, as computing maybe the original minimum. Um, yeah, the, the one thing maybe I, I will say is that you could maybe think of this, um, this cubature thing as kind of being an attempt at doing this, right? You are kind of mm -hmm. computing something which is, is quite similar to this harmonic bound, but now it's easy because I only have to evaluate this at finitely many points. Um, and it also gives me a bound. I don't have to do any, any SDP. I just have to do evaluations. Um, but, and this is, this is the no free lunch. You need a positive cubature rule. Um, and these can be quite large. So maybe I have to evaluate that some exponential number of points or, or whatever. Um, but this is an, a, a very interesting, interesting idea. And so I'm, yeah, yeah maybe, I'm, yeah. yeah, maybe a little shot in the dark that it could be easier to find a cubic rule if the functions are symmetric. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. So maybe if, if you, um, if you want to optimize, a an F, which has certain symmetry then you can find a cubature rule, which maybe only works for symmetric polynomial, something like this. Yeah, maybe. Um, okay, but uh, interesting talk. Thank you for your answer. Thanks. Okay. So thanks a lot, Lucas, again, for the nice talk. And I think we leave it at that for now. And uh, we have a lunch break and uh, we meet again at uh, two o'clock. <laughs>